The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IA exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. In our rapidly changing financial advice industry, it's now more important than ever to embrace new technology to digitize the client experience and realize business efficiencies. With a mobile app for clients and integrated managed accounts facility, NetWealth's platform has been rated number one for overall satisfaction by investment trends and is Chant West's advised product of the year for the last four years. Visit the website to learn how NetWealth can help you see wealth differently. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond Titus, and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into the Ethos ESG software actually worked in a bank in a past life, is a macro counter, and if you know, you know what that means, fa- is a founding member and chair of the XY Advisor Ethics Committee, and like me, is a fan of the intellect and humour of the Mr. Tim Minchin. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Nathan Fradley. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks. <laughs> Not at all. I love it. Look, we um, we are used to your dulcet tones on the XI Advisor podcast. Um, you've been interviewed by a few of the different hosts, haven't you, over the time? I think I very well may be the most XY podcasted podcast person. Most valuable player, perhaps. We might have it's to. With just the most attended. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Most number of minutes. Perfect. All right. Well, we need to add some more minutes to that. Um, I'm keen to dive into to Ethos, but first, let's get to know you through your technology use. What's your most used emoji? Do you use emojis? I'm a big emoji person. <gasps> really? Um, the, so the laughy face that has the like. Uh, droplet of water, like the, yes, uh, yeah, that I, that gets like burnt out on my phone. Like I'm pretty sure there's a dint on my keyboard <laughs> for how often I use that one. Okay, um, or the one that just has like no no mouth at all. Yeah, probably alternating between those two emojis. I'd say nice, nice, and they are different to the others we hear on. So I'm liking it. It should it, your unique personality shining through. All right, did my far more difficult question. If you had to delete all but three apps. On your smartphone, what would you keep? Well, that's it's funny you mentioned the micro the macro counter before. So, um, Chronometer is my new favorite app. Nice, and it it kind of replaced my fitness power because they got bought and then jacked all their prices up and they jumped on this and it it tracks. So I track all my macros, which is the macronutrients, protein, carbs, yep, and fats. Uh, it does a really good job of micronutrients, and then it has like all custom biometrics. So I track sleep, like mental health for the day. Um, a few other things like water drank nice. um, and meditation minutes. And then over time, it creates graphs for all of those. So you can like customize your own bits and pieces and map that out. So that's probably, that's my most used app on the phone. It's right. practical. Through the day. Um, at notes is the other one, like standard yep. Samsung notes. I'm all about that. There's so many notes in my phone. It's ridiculous. And none of them make any sense. Um, <laughs> and then, and I'm embarrassed to say TikTok. Ah, nice. Um, I'm a I'm a tragic, uh, <laughs> tragic on TikTok. Uh, it's how I keep up with the with the kids. With the kids, I'm. Yeah, I will be at some point diving into TikTok, but I know myself well enough to know that the minute I do, all hell will break loose. So <laughs> the algorithm to- is is horrifyingly good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it occasionally goes off track and you know when it's off track because it takes a test you and then just pulls it straight back. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a bad place. 
But yeah. also, Fun. I've learned an enormous amount on there, um, particularly around um, different areas of like, um, you know, gender and, and yep. sexuality, things like that. But it put me in the she's gays and they's category, apparently. So, right. I'm hanging out in that quarter and cool. I've learned huge amounts, which is really, really cool as well. So, it has a lot of education. There's just yeah. a lot of dopamine button pressing yeah which, yeah and that's that's what's holding me back i'll get there but i'm just yeah knowing yeah, myself maybe at the end of the year maybe when i'm on holiday so i'll dive into it so let's start talking ethos esg let's go up a bit and just sort of go a bit broad in terms of where it fits in the advice tech space you know what category does it generally fall under who are you lined up against that sort of thing i think i mean when it came out there was nothing that did what it did. Yep. So it, it sat against, um, I suppose, checklists, right? Like di- non digital checklists, and then a couple of research houses, okay, so like responsible returns and that sort of stuff. So it has yep. sort of these two faces. There's the client facing um, aspect, and then it has the research and reporting aspect in the back end. Right. Okay. Um, now, uh, Ethic Advisor is another similar but different product. So it's probably yep. uh, it's our only competitor in Australia. Yep. In the US, there's a number of different um, competitors that are okay. doing similar but different things, uh, okay. but none of them have launched over here yet. Okay, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. So they sort of gone a bit further, af- like further ahead in that sense. Yeah, they've often. tended to lean into investment management, though, which is weird. Different structures over there. Yeah. Um, open Invest, which is a different Open Invest to the one in Australia. Yeah. Um, they launched, and then JP Morgan ripped them off the shelf and used them internally only. So okay. Um, yeah, there's a there's been a few that have popped up along the way, but nothing really similar to ours. Yeah. Okay. And so broadly, we're talking, like you say, there's. So research, investment research, even if it's a, of a very specific type, um, but then also the client um, engagement on that sort of values element, which we'll get to in a second. So when, how old is Ethos? When, when did you kick this off? We officially launched on the 1st of July last year. <gasps> really? Yeah. It feels so like longer than that. It started in 2019. The build right. was started. Right. Um, so it was founded by um, a friend of mine, Luke Wilcox in the United States, background in uh, McKinsey and impact consulting. So okay. he used to do a lot of manual research and data work. Yep. Built it to work with retail clients. Yep. And discovered that and it was supposed to be like a measure your you know, employer's ratings, measure your own banks, your own investments, all that kind of stuff. Yep. But realized the financial argument for the app fell more with product providers and investment consultants and financial advisors. So yeah, okay. Started going down that path and I got involved in January last year, and we launched in July. Wow. Okay. So very young in that sense. Um, And I guess that sort of makes sense though, because in terms of the conversation around these things, that's really young too, maybe disappointingly young, but um, you know, it hasn't been around for all that long. So that means that your primary user sort of has evolved over time. So now I guess we're talking, you know, advisor, power planner, those sort of bodies that are the primary user of the tool. Is that right? Yeah, interestingly. So advisors were the original target um, demographic and it's yep. still a really important part of the business. Um, but we do a lot of work actually with um, investment consulting and SMA providers. Okay. So we've actually jumped up the chain a little mm. bit. Um, and so we work with the likes of InvestSense, um, Evergreen, yep. um, and a few others like Innova. They all use us at the back end yep. um, to help their ethical research um, along the journey. So, and obviously still working with advisors and, you know, the, the conversations with larger companies as well. Yeah. Um, larger investment companies have started, um, they started nine months ago, but you know, you meet eight people that are really happy and you've still got eight more people to meet before someone signs off on it. So they're always <laughs> a, a long yes. time to, to get something worked out. And that's, yeah. you know, we're talking about platforms and, and, and platform as in rap platforms. Yeah. We're talking about our fund managers, um, so that level as well. But fundamentally, yeah. the app is designed for financial advisors. The reason yeah. the others are all taking part is to be where the advisors are. Right, which makes a lot of sense. And, and they've got to be getting inundated with questions that are all centered around this. Like it's, they've got to be. Um, hmm. Because as advisors, we all are. You know, even in businesses that don't have this as a particular focus, um, I am for 
constantly surprised at who that person is asked. Not that it bothers me that they do, but I'm, it's never who you expect. You mm. know, and you think, and they, they're up, no, we don't want this or we do want that. And you know, wow, you know, this is starting to permeate more. This is becoming not just, I mean, everybody talks about millennials and the focus. It's, it's far broader than that now. Um, there are many age groups that, that want to make sure their money reflects them. I'd Definitely. say in my, by dollar value, my, um, pre retirees, retirees, um, are, Obviously, larger dollar value, so, mm. but also by customer number, I'd say they're just as prevalent as millennials. Perfect. Um, and I think that's an interest that it's important we sort of think that because we make so many assumptions about this stuff and we think it's all about the next gen and it just simply isn't. Um, just like we all have 47 recycling bins outside our homes for all the different things we do now, this has all become part of the vernacular and the way we, we all do it. You know, so I see this is that's where this is going to head. I believe right. this will just be a part of the process. Um, you know, using these sort of lens. So, in terms of then advisors, have you interacted much at the licensee level, or is it really by practice? How's that going? Uh, a bit of both. So, li- a number of licensees have looked at it and gone, "Yeah, we're happy with that." Um, the but we've gone to practice levels. So. Yeah. Practices that have come on board and said, "Yep, this is we're looking at a solution that." Um, both enables us to have the conversation, but then gives us an easy pathway to to answer the conversation. Um, so a lot more practices tend to be getting on board, but some of the larger licensee groups have, have absolutely already signed off on it, maybe for their advisors. Yeah, okay. And I guess that's always been the challenge with this, hasn't it, is we can um, start a conversation with our clients and we can ask them what they're interested in or what they want to avoid, but there's then that barrier of, but what do I do with that? <laughs> How do I actually reflect that for them, um, particularly without carte blanche just moving money? I think that's something that it's it's not realistic in the long term that we all just shift it in one place. What's better is if we can give them insight into where they are now and mm. improve it. You know, like let's just tweak it. Let's improve it for you so that it better matches you. So I, I can see how that is valuable um, and probably more sustainable for the whole industry as opposed to, oh, everybody just needs to be, you know, in that fund or in that. It's That's not going to work. You know, Especially, it, I think, as fast as this industry is growing because yeah. The, yeah, every fund manager under the sun is coming out with some form of, you know, green shirt wearing fund yep. depending on how you know, green they are, what approach they take. And some yep. of them are doing exactly as they've, as they've stated and they're not trying to be, a, you know, super duper uh, ethical. Mm-hmm. Others are, you know, hardcore impact funds. Yep. I think there's so many of them. If you jump all your dollars into one thing quickly and then you, you're writing another SOA in 18 months to move your clients and then you're writing another SOA in 18 yeah. months, that, that can be quite intense because of that product um, yep. development. And sometimes just looking and understanding current products and making those little changes and, and, and that's what we aim to do, you know, be able to see the current product and its, it's alignment to the client's values, which yep. is done through a questionnaire. And then compare that to the other options and go, okay, well, by moving this, what is the improvement and the yep. measurable um, implied impact? And then from there, do we make this move now or do we wait or do we move a little bit of it? Is there certain parts that we move now and yep. parts that we leave behind depending on the you know, costs and performance as well? Yeah, okay. So let's talk through that. So there's the the client can do this questionnaire and so that's really – I mean, it's it's another – personality questionnaire to the others we already do. And this is about their values, which is great. Um, and that has certain then filters or lens, I guess. It then gives the system. Are you finding, so what layers are you finding people are using it? So there's the do the values and then take a look at what their current portfolio measures against that. Yes. Then there's the, and let's go and find something that better fits as the yeah, next so layer. Is that right? I think that the, I suppose the first part of it is the questionnaire, which tries to simplify it down into 10 areas. But then within that, you've got different parts of it. So within the gender equality lens, you've got things like LGBTQ rights. You've got um, things like um, violence against women, that kind of thing. Um, So there's a variety of different internal metrics. We've got an entire screening process. So we have 70 screens that can be applied. Um, so I know Delene, um, who runs her own practice, um, does a lot of work with the AFA. She recently had a case for a couple, um, who wanted to ensure that they're, they're, they're an Islamic couple, want to make sure that their, um, portfolio aligned, um, yep. with the Sharia. So she was able to use that. We have a quick Sharia filter, put that straight over the top of the, of the, of the, um, current products. 
and then it has a research tool. So you can either align it to a particular product, you can build your own models, or you can just put the client in and sort by the most aligned, diversified, the most aligned Australian equities, the most aligned, whatever that might be, and build that out from there. Right. Perfect. And then reporting on that, I think, is the most valuable part is then what it takes from there is to say, okay, well, here's where you currently are. And here's what you've gained or what you've lost. So from a yeah. client's perspective, that's great. Um, but then also from a client, it's simple, it's visual, it's colorful, and, and nice. they can very quickly understand it's better. And I yeah. think for most clients, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for perfect. They're looking for better. Yeah, and I think that's probably where advisors probably have gone wrong with this historically is we've all viewed it as a, a one, 100% or 0% game. Like it's either you're all in and it's all got to be <laughs> – Wonderful across all possible lenses, or I just don't do it, which yeah. it just is, is also not how anything improves anyway. So I love the idea of even, you know, the first step, just letting the clients work out what they care about. Let's just start, just do the questionnaire, find out your priorities, because some people never have thought about these things that way. You know, once they once you ask, they're like, yeah, I do care about gender equality. I really do. You know, so I think helping them enunciate that in, in itself is a bit of a gift. I is think he- if you're looking at it, there's nothing in that list of 10 causes that someone doesn't care about. Right. It's healthcare, it's education, it's, yeah. li- it's life on earth and biodiversity. It's, you know, they could be a climate change denier and still find value within the ethos tool. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got um, different customer bases um, in the United States that use it with a tailored version that specifically tailors for, you know, certain Christian faith values yep. or, or other aspects as well. So there, it can be tapered and tailored to what, a practices philosophy is as well. Perfect. And so it's more than just ethical investment advice. It's values-based advice and a lot right. better aligning values and giving you a measurable tool to say a fee is a dollar value, a performance mm. over seven years is a percentage value. This is a score you know, on a, on a bell curve for alignment. So it yeah. gives you that extra piece of information to make that comparison. And what I like about that too is, like you say, you could you can – get them to do the to do the assessment, measure where they're at, and you may not act immediately because you may not be able to act. Who knows what, where they are, um, the platform they can't move, whatever the reason might be. However, to say then at the next review, and you know what, there's now an option that actually is going to better fit now we can act. Like I love that being something that's just constantly measured against um, over time and constantly tweaked. I think what's interesting too, I'm finding a bit of feedback from advisors. They're surprised at how decent – a number of the industry super funds are. Right. Yep. Um, because they have, you know, since in 2019, uh, REST was sued. Um, it yes. was me, Vavi REST case. And they've been under an enormous amount of pressure to improve this across all of their investments, not yep. just the socially responsible option. Um, but funds like Australian Super, their, their voting record on environmental social governance matters is between 70 and 80%. That's better than some specialist funds. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if the client is concerned about progress, but they're not necessarily concerned about specific holdings. Right. That could be something that, you know, we because we the scores are based on the holdings themselves. Yep. And then the engagement record of a company, how much of, of a fund, how often they actually go out and, and talk to, um, you know, the different companies on what they're doing and yep. then voting in line with ESG values. So yep. you can have great holdings. Um, and so some of the index funds, really, really good screens, rubbish engagement. Right. Versus some of the other funds, great engagement, but they might have a couple of companies. You might go, oh, yeah, they've got one of the banks or the, you know, they've right. got BHB. But actually, overall, for that client, that actually aligns better. Yeah, okay. And so it's it's not a one size fits all. That's the whole the whole premise of the of the questionnaire is to personalize the rating. So things that you care about, Peter, versus things that I care about, we could look at the same investment with completely different scores. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody's, you know, considering starting down this path, is there anything you feel they should be doing prior to, you know, sort of wheeling in a tool like this? Is there some prep work? Is there like, what can they be doing that will really mean when they roll this out to to clients, they sort of just pick it up and run with it? I think before you use any tool, the tool fits within a process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're when you're presenting a tool like this, when you're presenting a risk profile, when you're when you're going to go through, you know, a goal setting exercise, whatever it is, you've got to be able to position it. Yeah. And I think a lot of the time, advisors who get excited about the software and they come to me, go, I started using it, but I kind of fumble. 
Right. It's like, well, okay, why are we fumbling? Because we haven't practiced. Yeah. You know, when we first started in this industry, we practiced our pair of lines and our ways we describe how super works and all that so many times mm. and it becomes natural to us now. I think you need to be able to, I suppose, firstly understand your internal organization or your personal value. Where do you sit on this line yep. for a client? Not for you. You could them. be, you know, super ethical. You could be, I don't really care more about index or I could be, you know, prefer- preferencing sin stocks, like whatever. Yeah. But for your clients, are you, uh, you know, positive as in you want to encourage and in which case that's a bias and it needs to be disclosed? Yeah. Are you negative and you want to discourage, in which case that's a bias and it needs to be disclosed? Or are you neutral and you want to make sure they understand the opportunity? And then if you've decided where you sit, then – how do you explain what ethical or responsible or whatever word you want to use investment is to a yeah. client? Yeah. Instead of just being like, oh, do you want ethical investments? No. Okay. No. Right. Like they got no idea. No. The client doesn't understand what that means. No. Um, half the industry doesn't understand what that means. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, how do you explain that? And, you know, um, do, you, do you want me to consider whether or not this portfolio or your portfolios align with some of your values. Yeah. Oh, what does that mean? Well, when we look at the companies that they invest in, there might be some things that make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, or do you want to focus purely on fees and performance? Uh, so I think that's a really important thing. Uh, understanding that's probably a basic step and then practicing a little bit using things like the checklist of rare websites and things like that. You don't need to jump straight to tech. Yep. Um, this question, like our questionnaire, you can send to a client, get them to fill out and they can send it back. And yeah. you can do it that way or you can do it with the client and you can get a much better understanding of it because you're working with it with a lack of risk profile. The value comes in the conversation and the intimacy, yeah. understanding um, what, what's said, not what's clicked on. Yeah, okay. But, you know, for people starting out, even just having that as a basis um, can be really helpful as well, depending on how you operate in your process. So I think identifying where it fits and the process and how you explain it before you look at any tech, you've got to be able to do that, especially client-facing tech. And I'd argue, like, you know, if you're within a business, um, then, what, like, yourself and the team need to go through this process. Like, mm. <laughs> you know, experience it yourselves, Whether, like you say, whether it's using tech or not, go through it yourselves because if you can be really self-aware as you're doing that, you'll work out where, hey, you know what, I think we need something that explains that really well they can revisit. Or I think we need it, you know, like, you'll be able to define that journey um, a lot clearer, which is where this stuff I believe can really have impact is when the bouncy ball is clear for them, just in terms of what the journey is. The um, best tech in the world misexplained is useless because if a client right. doesn't engage with it, the advisors won't engage with it. If advisors don't engage with it, it's a waste of money. Correct. If you use an online fact find tool and you say to a client, oh, we're just going to email this out or you don't even say anything, you just send it to them. Chances are they're not going to engage on it. No. If that fact find tool has connecting bank accounts and bit level of technology, which makes everyone's world easier, and you just send it to them, they're not going to do that. Mm-mm. But if you say, I'm going to send this through to you, and it's really important for us that you give us as much information as you can. Don't get bogged down in too much detail, but it would be really helpful if you can connect the bank accounts because it will help for these reasons. They're yeah. going to do it. Yeah. If you don't say any of that, you just send it to them, they're, they're not. And then that full that you know dominoes the entire process. It goes with any tech, I think. Yeah, absolutely it does. And, I mean, the word experience is so important in that. Um, you know, technology is just another you know, tool in your belt effectively um, to define and create and really put energy into that experience. And I think that's where something like this is different because it's it's far more about them and how they feel, right, about things. And I think that is something that we're not necessarily leaning towards when we're engaged. I mean, we all, we all might endeavor to do that as good advisors, but I think to have this where it's specifically talking about how they feel about things, I think is powerful because you're right. That's going to spin off into all sorts of other conversations about their kids or why they want to raise them. Like all sorts of things can start from this. So I think even though what you've built is, is you know, analytic, analytical, clearly, you know, research and all that sort of uh, quantifiable, I think it will spin off into a whole lot more of warm and fuzzies than we might expect. I hope um, so. Yeah, because I think it can be the, the sort of root of that conversation. So then – Okay, so a practice might decide to embark all of this. They've really thought about how to entree it and then um, they're engaging with the client on that. What are you seeing in terms of, uh, you know, how much are people showing or sharing? You know, are some just utilising the um, questionnaire and and then the output is just some advice? Or like what are you seeing in terms of how people are using the tool? I I think what we expected to happen, uh, so the – 
several parts of the UX I designed. Um, and so when we first launched it, I, you know, I designed this UX, I did it on paint and sent it to the developers because mm-hmm. I'm, that's not my game. Yeah. But we designed this um, awesome thing that you could search by all the asset classes and you could load in your clients' values and screens and, and really narrow down and build a portfolio that aligns to them. Yep. Um, and what I've discovered is most advisors go straight to either an SMA or a multi-manager. Right. That's what they want to know. So we added in that screen and that's the most common way it's used. They have the conversation they jump into the, the solution tool. They put it in the clients, you know, load the client into that tool, and they just pick diversified and growth assets to this percentage, and bang, there's their list. Okay. And then they have a quick look at a couple of them, compare them, put it on file, and then they use that to present, So, which I found really interesting. I thought there'd mm. be a lot more portfolio construction. Yeah, Um But that Me hasn't too. tended to be the case. Um, it's been very much um, that and some great feedback we've had is where we've had people who say inherited clients come in. I've just inherited three hundred thousand dollars of shares from Nan. Can we have a look at them? And they've been able to load those individual stocks into the system, right? And look at the ones that align versus didn't, and then put that with the tax implications to determine what to keep and what not to keep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, perfect. So th- those are sort of the two big use cases I've seen for it. Yep. Um, but then behind the scenes, we've seen then the SMA providers start using it to build the portfolios to go yep. on that because of the demand we're seeing on the other side. So, um, and then I suppose from a UX perspective, you know, we first launched it, it was pretty open ended. It was a bit of sandbox. Mm-hmm. And we found ourselves spending a lot more time talking people and ha- teaching people how to use it. Right. So um, I went over to the States to meet the team and we sat down and we spent four days whiteboarding and redesigning the UX. And we did what's called taking a pi- an opinion on the software. This is how we think you should use it. Right. So you can use it any way you want. And we've got our menu at the side, which we call the Black Diamond Run. Yep. Um, so that's anyone who's advanced can jump into that. Right. But if you just follow the bouncing ball, you create the client, you add the assets, you, you se- select the options, you load them in and you run a report. It's done. And it, okay. it's it's a more seamless activity. Um, and we found an enormous amount more engagement from simplifying the process, which is hilarious because that's what we're always looking for as advisors with our clients. And then yeah. the advisors at the back end also wanted that seamless UX experience as well. So always tweaking it. But yeah, I think that's been a, a big increase in engagement too. Yeah. And I think it's really hard when you're deep in something and as advisors with like this and, and you in terms of this topic, it's very hard to remember what it, was, what it was like when you weren't. It's very hard to do that. And that's what UX is because it was us at the beginning. Like, mm. so yes, but I don't know enough yet, you know, so it's, it's, um, it always evolves over time, that sort of stuff. So it's, it's great to hear that you guys are sort of relooking at that um, because this, path feels like a long one that's going to see a lot of change and improvement and and buy-in, I think, from advisors generally. And so, you know, to make it easy for people who maybe even themselves aren't down this path as individuals, but see the value for their clients, you know, the more we can make that easy for them, the better it will all be. Yeah. Um, and I think sense. if I'm spending less time teaching you how to use this software, yeah. then I can spend more time teaching you how to do the first part, how yeah. to have a better process to put a client right. through it or what how to explain it better. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. the software teaches you how to use itself. And then yeah. my values, it's like with, you know, in advice, I could just do your super or I could determine the impact of that on your broader situation. There's so much more value in that broader stuff. Yeah, um, definitely. For, for me, but also for our users. Yeah, I completely agree. So let's talk integrations. Where are you at with integrating with other things out there? So we're completely open API, mm-hmm. um, which means that we can plug it into anything and everything. And so we've got a few things floating around. Um, so we've had discussions with, um, I'm, I can't really name names. No, that's good. Um, that's but we've had discussions with another um, similar research house. So we're yep. currently building that out. So we'll actually be able to pull their research and they're a top down and we're a yep. bottom up. So we'll be able to pull theirs into ours. Awesome. Yeah, we're working with the same people with a completely different approach to this, so it doubles up. Yeah. Um, and then platforms, um, we've had a, we're having a number of conversations with the majors around the initial process to, to merge in and then a more advanced one down the track. Uh, you nice. know, and, and I think in an ideal world, we'd love to have a, a limited version of the software available on all platforms mm. with a more you know, advanced or comprehensive version you know, off to the side. So that everyone can jump in and maybe search through the platform's investment menu to right. see what's in there instead of just typing the word ethical or sustainable. Yeah. And, and speaking to platforms and they're having the same issue. They're like, we don't know what to put on this from the ethical perspective. Yeah. So we can use your software to identify 
what the best options are. And then, so it all kind of molds in together um, into this big amalgamation of everyone's trying to figure out what is a good and what is not a good ethical investment option for clients. And and I remember actually it, it was, I think when you this all sort of first started and you were talking about all this and, um, and you know, I was chatting to a platform who was sort of asking for feedback on what they should have. And I said, you guys need to have this in a, in a smaller fashion. And one of the reasons is when they've got that tool and it, even if it's a paired back version and just for their platform, they're going to see what, and let's say it's only targeting even advisors. It's not even a client's yet. They're going to see what we're trying to get. So it's like a, a it's, it's an early indicator for what they need to be hunting for to put on the platform. Like guys, you don't need to ask us all the time or do a survey or anything. We're going to be searching for it and there won't be an answer yet. <laughs> so, you know, add those up when the figure gets big enough, go and find, you know, the fund manager or who, whoever can provide that solution. In the spirit of what we do, you know, everything we do is transparent. So yeah. um, our data, you can see exactly where we get our data points. So we collect data from about 260 different sources. Yep. Um, it's all our own data. We don't just purchase someone else's data and repackage it. Um, and that every data point, you can view exactly where it's come from and what the normalized point of that is. Right. For the institutional investors, they can get the raw data. Um, but from that perspective, in the same way, we release what clients are looking for. So, you know, we've had, I think our first report on this, we had a thou- over a thousand um, unique completions that weren't right. trial accounts. And that enabled us to say, okay, the top three causes are climate change, sustainable resource use, and gender equality. Now, climate change, most funds focus on. Yep. Sustainable resource use, yes. Gender equality, not so mm-hmm. much. No. So, immediately, we had a number of funds contact us and go, hey, we'd love to learn more about this because this starts to show where the demand sits. What are investors caring about? And we have that data from the coalface. Yeah. Ha-ha <laughs> joke. Um <laughs> And I think that's really, really powerful yes. um, to be able to, you know, use data, but use it for, for good, not just to hoard it. Yeah, because this will be a process, right? Because, you, you know, we're, you're raising awareness by having conversations with clients and then interest, you know, like it's a, okay, let, let me understand what I've got. Oh, but now I want to be more like away from this or towards this. And that, you know, so to, to have both parts, it's going to take time. But I think there is going to be lots of early indicator data that's going to mean that all they've got to do is be aware of it and start to develop options that feed into that rather than responding to noise. And I think that's the problem. And it's, I think it's part of what feeds into, you know, greenwashing, all this sort of stuff that goes on out there is they're just responding at this marketing sort of volume level instead of actually understanding what people want. Mm. and just meeting that need, would you please? Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So is there any features on it that you think people don't sort of take advantage of as much as you think they could that are maybe underplayed or underused? I mean, the the portfolio construction portion I think is underused a bit. But um, I think what we're not seeing is we're not seeing people who run it with every single client. Right. Um, and I think that's something we will see more and more of. Mm. The more that people use it, the more comfortable they get, the more they'll be able to pull that, pull it up with their clients and put it on file. Yeah. And it's it comes back to the what I call the, the the trifecta of product. It used to be price and performance, now it's price, performance, and ethics. Yeah. It reinforces the values behind this, and I think it also changes views. So you know, I had a client recently in the advice practice side of things, and so it was a couple, and they were both in index based products, mm-hmm. and we took them through. They wanted to see what it was all about and make the dis- make an informed decision, and she ended up going down the ethical route. He decided not to. Yep. Um, because when she saw that the index was sitting at a 52 average score. Yep. Um, and, sh- and you know, there was 270 fossil fuel companies in it. She was uncomfortable with that. Yeah. So she opted to make that change. And I think we'll start seeing that piece of engagement come more and more. Yep. But the, the data and reporting can do the work for you. The yep. whole idea is it's ESG done easy. Um, what I think we the feedback we're getting as advisors just need a little bit more confidence in those conversations yep, um, to, to build and to build. Um, and, and it's like any software. The more you use it, the, the better it gets. Yeah, look, and I think that's probably, I mean, in terms of us and a practice where I've been getting us to is where it would be sort of right alongside the risk, pro- like it would just be an automatic part of the process for us. That's the, mm. I wanted it to, to be that um, rather than a reaction to a query a person makes. Um, well, so I sort of wanted to that. fold We've it out just to. as part of the process. 
We chatted to a few licensees about that exact thing. Mm. And if there's enough demand because of the software, we can build the risk profile into the ethos As well, tool. right. It's just questions. It's, yeah. And it can store with the client. It's all there. It's the same seamless process. Yeah, okay. Um, and there's a few aspects to that, you know, the the likes of, you know, and we've had the conversations, like I say, with Product Rex, um, which is a great app and mm. being able to push the recommendations to there and then you can slap that in your SOA. Yeah. So these things that we can be doing because we're light and agile that we are seamless. So Which, that's, I think that's the next stage I'd love to to go to is you hit a saturation point where integrations make sense and yeah. bam, now you've got efficiencies. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I think, you know, that was sort of one of the things I was going to ask about is, you know, what's down the path. And I agree, you guys are going to be able to do more when more of us are using it more, like in, in terms of through the practice rather than exceptions. I'm, I'm betting that this is more, well, sorry, generally, you know, ethical approach is is more exception based for mm. people aside from maybe yourself where it's literally a pitching point like it's something that people that you attract people towards you as an advisor by mm. you know for the for those of us who maybe don't do that then we're using it as exception and I'm having and having played like I have with the tool I think you know it's getting us all to the point where it's just a given we just do this and some people will go nah I'm cool with it what you know you've you've filtered it and I, I don't feel a need to change it good tick on file like I think that's fantastic and, and informed choices mm. aside from being, you know, better from a phase your perspective are just better for the consumer. I um, think, um, you know, that's definitely the more use and more integration makes more use. That's yeah. definitely. I think the other thing we'd really like we're pushing down the path of is I think as a platform, we will have more holding started than anyone else in Australia. Right. Um, which we've discovered because we've looked at purchasing or, down, um, subscribing to holding starter and most that the amount of holdings with percentages of weightings is actually quite low. Okay. Um, they usually top tens disclosed. Um, yep. We require full um, or for a, prop, for a proper assessment, we require full holdings. We don't disclose it, yep. um, but we have it. And so that's an interesting thing. So we can start looking at you know, the amount of information we will have on what's out there in Australia and we, the, what we can start drawing trends between and all these kinds of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. All very, very exciting. Yeah, perfect. So now I've got a, um, a – look, it's it's somewhat cheeky, this question about the future, but one of the things that um, – and I don't believe the tool does this yet, but maybe you're intending it to is – so we've been looking at where a fund manager invests, okay, and, and the way they're investing and therefore you're assessing all of that based on the client's measure of values. What intention or hope do you have for doing the same to the fund manager themselves, to the platform, to the insurer? So measuring the full spectrum of the vertical experience for the client to those values, you know, so really getting to the point where it's across the board, where we can sort of reflect that full. And because, you you know, we would all know that there'd be um, – money that's invested the way somebody might like to, but the business then might have a different measure depending on what your value focus is. Um, you know, maybe gender equality is one, you know. So I'm curious how, you know, do you have any intention of going down that path or do you see that happening in the future? We have started looking at that actually from a bank account perspective. So we don't okay. have cash accounts rated and we're in the process at the moment of of whiteboarding like to come to a solution very soon yeah. of how we rate bank accounts and the use, use of cash and term deposits within the yep. institution. So it'll be a, we're, we're either going to apply the full company screening. So if you had HSBC bank accounts, that's a screen. Yep. Um, but I think we'll report differently on it. Yeah. So there'll be certain reporting aspects that'll come out that'll be more related to if you're holding deposits in HSBC, then here's the percentage fossil fuel financing um, or do- total dollar fossil fuel financing yeah. that's coming off that and things like that. Yeah. So that's definitely the first stage of that process. Yep. Um, and then, you know, when it, when it's listed, it's easy. Mm. When it's unlisted, it's a bit trickier, but we do have mm. a lot of unlisted assets as well. Mm. So the up, the up and down the line, would would yeah definitely be something at some stage we'd like to have that full picture um that yeah but i think bank accounts is definitely the first step yeah it's okay. the natural natural well, step it's a literal there. investment still so it's just you know one step further along and what you're right once you've done that for a bank perspective then rolling that out for other corporates essentially mm, yeah at that so level, that we do have sense. eight thousand yeah. listed companies um so if you were curious about you know your um cfs or macquarie rap or yep. whatever it might be you can look up the parent company and get the them directly yeah yeah 
um, and that can help your decision. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as mentioned with things like gender equality and that kind of stuff, you can jump into, you know, that bank and you can go to data and you can click the gender equality score and it will tell you all of those gender equality data points. You know, what is their percentage of women on board? Um, what is their percentage of women in management? What's their gender pay gap? All that stuff is there. Yeah. But it's just not automatically applied from a platform level. Yeah. Um, from a fund operations level, that's where this um, partnership with another this other research house will come in because yep. they assess how the fund does, not what the fund does. So, okay. because we are the fund's holdings and um, engagement, where theirs is more process orientated, they'll actually have that come the other way. So, that's a different skill set that we're, yeah, okay. we're not outsourcing, we're partnering to yep. solve. Exciting. Um, because I think, you know, you you can change the things you measure. So once we start measuring at all these different layers, then you can start changing things because it'll become more obvious what people want or want to see focused on. Um, and there has been flags already that that's occurring. You know, it's it's um, you know major institutions having shareholders say no, you're not promoting that person because of that historical behaviour, like things like that that never used to happen. You know, like that just was not <laughs> how it worked. It's clear that that is a rolling, you know, there's, there's a snowball effect here. So it's exciting to, you know, imagine where that might go down the track. And it's not, I think um, perhaps with this sort of topic, people think this is about pitchforks and things. It's, it's anti. It's not to me. It's just transparency. Hmm. And then you get to choose and some things you're just not going to care about. That doesn't mean you don't care as a person generally. It's just what's your filter? What's your value lens? And then you can make an informed choice. I think that's exciting. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, in terms of that, what you choose to measure point. So we've built out an entire framework for measuring the purpose of green, green, blue, and socially and sustainable linked bonds. So yeah. at the moment, we measure the parent company. But if you've got a company like BNP Paribas, you know, they are, or at least they were two years ago, the greatest um, producer or releaser of um, green bonds yep. and also one of the biggest fossil fuel lenders in the world. Right. So they kind of have both sides. Yeah. Because they're a bank. Yeah. Now, one of their green bonds may be amazing. Yeah. But it was being it's being rated by the issuer. So, you know, we've built that framework out and it just takes the demand for people to go, yep, that's what we're, we're into. Right. We want to know more about that and we can properly resource it and bang, we can roll that out. So it does come back to sometimes we wish we could do everything at once. Mm. If we launched 12 months ago, we probably shouldn't do that. We should stage <laughs> things out. But yeah, the being being able to better tailor and personalize. Um, the reporting experience more and more and more is, is obviously the end goal. Yeah, fantastic. And like, yeah, I mean, these things will evolve just like the experience um, of what, you know, or what clients want and hence what you're responding to with the tool and what advisors will need to do. I mean, you and I could have been at an event five years ago and, and this would have been a topic that wouldn't have even have hit the main stage of an event. You know, it's just, you know, this is this is evolving um, quickly. And so I think it's actually exciting that you guys have got this far, this fast, to be honest, um, because without tools like this, we would all be trying to do digging that would be tough. You know, it would it would actually be tough to get your head around it. Um, no, I can speak from experience from someone who used to have to draw PDSs. Right. And look at look at holdings and control F Paris Accord in voting records and do all of that okay. manually. It it wasn't it wasn't really worth it. No, like it the amount of time involved, um, but not being able to rely on the external the the existing yep. um, ratings houses because yep. they were just so inconsistent and completely untransparent. Yeah, which is fundamentally where we we founded the the principle of transparency was we sh we want to be tested. If we're wrong, tell us, mm. show us your case, and if we're wrong, we'll we'll fix it. Yeah. Um. So that becomes a really important part of what we do instead of just saying no. This is our rating. Full stop. Closed door. Yeah. 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 And I think it's an interesting. It is an interesting language, isn't it? Like the whole ratings thing is is uh you know a winner loser sort of approach when this is this is just measuring based on your own metrics and then shifting forward you know from where you are now to where you want to be so i think it's an interesting even though i know that ratings is what we all talk about and it's language we use but i think maybe over time we've got to change that dynamic and mindset a bit more so that it's just we're, it's we're looking for improvement whatever mm. that means to you and it's going to be different for you you know for you Nathan to me Peter to like let's just improve it all for you um, rather than good, bad, 
you know, um, five star, three star, like all that stuff uh, probably isn't dynamic enough. It's not three dimensional enough, I think, really for where we're going to need to go. We saw that with the with the um, Tesla being dropped from the S and P five hundred sustainability index. Yep. Um, and Tesla, um, despite what you know, my opinions of Elon Musk might be, the company itself has attributed an enormous amount to progression in in the electric vehicle and um, capacitor technology. Right now, if that's your thing, if you're really into climate change, then that company is a great company for right. you. Uh, if you're really into workers' rights. Um, maybe not so much. Maybe not, yeah. So that yeah. those two comparisons, when that whole debate was happening, is this an ESG company, blah, 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 what, who's right, who's wrong? We loved it. We thought it was great because we were like, no one's right, no one's wrong. No. It depends what you care about. Correct. Um, there is yeah. no thumbs up or thumbs down anymore, folks. It just doesn't work that way anymore. I mean, there may be like the deep thumbs there's, down. There's there might definitely be the, some like, thumbs the, up and thumbs down, but the dead not star in this version. One. <laughs> but <laughs> but but um, perhaps it's it's all about nuance and and change. Now, have we missed any other elements, key elements of the tool of how advisors should utilize it? Do you look, think? Look, I, I think not, because I try and keep it simple. Fundamentally, you, you put a, a questionnaire either in front of or with a client. Um, it takes two minutes. You um, take that back, look at that in comparison to their current investments and some options, and you take that to them and you show them those options. You can mute the the names of those so they yep. don't know what exact products they are. Um, and then you can talk to things like performance and, and fees in alignment with that and come up with a solution that is in their best interest with yep. a number that instead of just saying, oh, this says ethical in the title and this doesn't, yeah. therefore one is better than the other. Um, I think it fundamentally underpins, you know, our product replacement responsibilities, but reports it in a way that's really valuable to a client. And yeah. they can they can look at the report. You don't have to say much. It does the report does all the talking. It makes it real. And and that's pretty much it. It's it's the questionnaire, it's the research, it's the recommendations. And if we keep it as simple as that, advanced users go bananas on it. But I think <laughs> every advisor can get around that. Yeah. Um, there is a there's a free trial, but there's a free account as well. Um, you can also just jump on the website and look at a fund. Yep. Um, again, going back to that transparency piece, we want this information available. We want to be useful. Um, we also need to have a viable business model. We're finding the balance there. But you know, fundamentally, we, we, we want people to use this to drive change. Yep. And it, that's all it is. It's a tool to enable advisors to have better conversations. Yeah. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Ethos ESG, then the website link is in the episode show notes, along with Nathan's LinkedIn details. So I'm sure he'll point you towards somebody potentially who can help, but um, you can always reach out to him. Thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. I mean, I've learned a lot. I feel far more informed than I was before with my own little tinkering. Um I really love that sort of ethos is giving this us this way to start these conversations with clients, even if we just inform before we transform, you know, even if it's just giving them more information and insight, it's not just into their investments, potentially into themselves. That's sort of really fascinating to me. And I think could make this a whole lot more fun for advisors than maybe they thought it would be. So thank you for delivering that to us. Thank you so much for having me. Ooh, so listener, are you currently using Ethos? Maybe you've looked at it, you considered it, or maybe like like myself, you're sort of early days in that journey of how you're going to involve ethical investing in your practice. No matter where you're at, I'd encourage you to share your insights on the XY community platform. I'd love to hear how you're going. I know others would too, because this is something that's relatively new to this industry. So any tips, insights, or questions you have, then please let's get them all on that XY community platform. And as for sort of my take, then look, whenever I'm considering a new tool for something I wasn't doing before, right? So rather than it being in the situation where it's just replacing one I already have, um, Instead, you know, it might be one where I'm going to essentially add to the list of, of tech that I use. Then I always get a bit wary because I just don't want to add another app into the tech stack. You know, at some point, the tech stack's just going to topple over due to its sheer weight, right? So given we're sort of coming up to the end of the year, you know, it's going to be a new year, not so long, then I think it makes sense for us to do a tech audit. This just involves writing down every piece of technology you use and every piece of technology you pay for and perhaps technology you don't use and pay for, right? This should have a huge list here. Make sure you include the email tool you use, 
productivity tools like Office 365 or G Suite, every little app, software, tool, and website you pay to get access to. And remember, it's not just software or apps. It's also all of those websites we pay to get access to as well. And just see, is there something you just don't use anymore? You know, maybe you gave it a try for a while, but it just didn't take. Um, That's okay. You know, this is the flip side of being curious. It's perfectly normal. You try something out. But the key thing is we need to make sure we don't keep on paying for things we're just not using. Now, all it means that we do, once we've done our tech audit and you sort of cleaned house a little, all you then need to do is every time you consider a new app or piece of tech, we just see if there's one we can turn off, right? One in, one out. <laughs> it's a way to keep things streamlined and will probably ensure you don't accidentally end up with a few hundred dollars a month of unused technology, which I can very honestly say I have done in the past. So please listen to an old hand at this stuff and make sure you just keep on top of that and, and keep on cleaning house of the technology you're using. Now, given we were just talking to Nathan about sustainability and and looking after Mother Earth, then today's Curiosity Corner app keeps up with that theme. The app is called Forest. Now, you can find it at forestapp.cc. So that's F-O-R-E-S-T-A-P-P dot C-C. This is actually a phone game, but it's a phone game that gives you time rather than taking it away. Who thought it? <laughs> when you're ready to really focus on something, right? You've got something you want coming up, you really want to focus on. It could be a piece of work, could be some study, or even you just want to chill out and you want to do it properly, right? Then in the app, you just plant a tree. Now, your tree will grow while you focus on that task. But should you leave the task halfway, your tree will die. So basically, by staying focused daily, you can turn your hard work or your focus into a land of lush forest. And as if that wasn't cool enough, (laughs) Forest has partnered with a real tree planting organization called Trees for the Future to plant real trees out in the world. So when the app users choose to spend their virtual coins they earn in forest on planting real trees, the forest team actually donates to Trees for the Future and creates planting orders in the real world. Now, I know this is an unusual one for me to suggest, but I really love how it's sort of combining a better world with helping us get more personal focus and productivity. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice, tech fix, automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you're keen to build a niche that loves what you do and will pay for it and then have a plan to scale up your business so that you really love looking after them, then be sure to register your interest in our Niche Down and Scale Up Masterclass. The first will be in Sydney in early 2023, but we're getting loads of interest in all sorts of other locations. So please keep reaching out as as soon as we get you know, that right number, then we'll absolutely start adding some locations to our tour. You can um, reach out to me via direct message on LinkedIn to Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful holiday break and come back ready, ready to go on firing in January and super excited to get your bionic advisor muscles flexing. I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next year. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.